Welcome back. You're listening across the border. It's our Prophecy Reality Edition. And we've been talking about the history of Protestantism in our first segment and what it really means to be a Protestant. Uh, the whole idea of uh, true Christianity. And as our good friend uh, J.A. Wiley said, in a word, Protestantism is revived Christianity. And it was born out of a protest against a corrupt and apostate church more than 500 years ago. Uh, the true Christianity uh, had always been around, and we've traced that uh, through history many times here. Uh, also, the history of Protestantism uh, begins the, the work that we're working on right now. And if anyone wants a copy of this, um, you can get it at archive.org. Just put the a history of Protestantism, and uh, there's three volumes there. You can get the original PDFs of that there uh, if you're interested in that. But it's a long, very long read. Like I said, I'm going to see if I can get uh, when Tom Press is done with the history of Romanism. I'm going to see if I can get him to go on the history of Protestantism. Uh, it may take him another. I don't know how long it's going to take him to finish the history of Romanism, but uh, it should take them just as long <laughs> to go through the history of Protestantism. And uh, anyway, so uh, Tom Press always needs your prayers. He always asks for your prayers, especially for his health, because I know he wants to keep on working and doing the work that he's doing here on uh, sharing these great works with uh, as many people as he can, uh, especially through the uh, media of the Internet, uh, these these programs that we do here uh, between myself and Tom uh, that we try to do here, we try to keep them timeless, as timeless as God's Word. Uh, it, well, not as timeless as God's Word, but in, in our temporal or temporal sense. Uh, we don't date the programs. Uh, we think they'll be as relevant 10 years, 30 years from now as they are today as they were when they were originally written. And nobody else is out there doing this kind of stuff, uh, or very few people are, seem to be a minority that are interested in true Protestantism. The whole world is drunk on socialism and hedonism. Uh, the churches are falling to it too. Uh, it would be a sad history of Protestantism if we had to fill up the volume from 1870 to today uh, and the the advance of Protestantism or revived Christianity in the world because we can see a great downturn in the effects of Protestantism. Uh, the terrors are getting stronger and stronger and they're always more vocal and evil men cheat and because that's what they do. If we don't cheat, uh, uh, thinking about how difficult it is uh, to overcome evil in the world when evil can do anything it wants to do, but we are we are constrained by the law of God as to what we can do as God's people, and that's fine. I can't complain. I'm not. I don't want to violate God's law, but it puts us at a disadvantage in the world. It does because they can cheat, get away with it in the world. So they're cheap and and getting away with it is only temporal for us and we know that. That's why we cannot do uh, as the world does. And we have all that written in God's Word. So we, we know how to act like God's people. It may put us on a disadvantage temporally speaking, but uh, eternally speaking we have the advantage because we know this life uh, this mortal existence is only a beginning, and we all long for the day. I mean, we all struggle with uh, temptations and tribulations in this life, and Jesus told us that men would hate us, and in this life you will have tribulation. We we struggle with our, our sin nature, all of these things. We, we learn from God's Word, and uh, as we repent, we walk the road of repentance, uh, God chooses to for, to perfect us, and that perfecting us is a process 
of being perfected continually. So he continually perfects us. He doesn't just wave a magic wand over us and now we're perfect. Because if he was going to do that, I'd be first in line, you know, because I would like to, you know, to get to a point where I'm never tempted to sin and I will never sin and, and I can erase from my mind all of the the evil and things that I've seen and heard and done in my past that were violated God's law and I never even have to think about them again. Never have to be tempted again. Never have to struggle again. And see, that's the true desire of true Christianity, of a true Christian man, woman, or child, is they desire to never, ever sin again. And that desire will be fulfilled in the resurrection. Until then, we have to struggle, we have to deal with temptation, and we will have tribulation. But we can also store up treasure in heaven, in God's kingdom. We can invest in his eternal kingdom. In addition to, to getting there and receiving all of the promises of God, we can store up, we can have a, well, we call it like a bank account, right? You can't draw it out and buy a new Maserati today with it. And what it'll be worth in the, in the resurrection, I really don't know. But, uh, the idea of storing up treasure in heaven uh, should not be an idle idea. It's one we leave in God's hands as to what the value of it will be because we know that God is good and that we don't have to worry about the value of it. If Christ said that's where we need to store up our treasure and place our value there from this life, all of the things that we're trading in, that the world seeks and the world works for and the world wants and all the pleasures of this life and the, you know, that come with this deceitfulness and riches and all of those things that we do, a shoe we don't want. Now well, we know that we're storing all of that value up in the resurrection in eternity in the kingdom of God. And it's in God's hands and we will receive our reward then. Okay, what else? Let me see. Let me check the chat room here and see if we got any comments, questions. Let's see. Count it all joy. Thank you for that, WW. I uh, hope everything is going well for you, Tom, over there on, still on the East Coast. Uh, still, uh, treasure the time, the little time we had together when you came out to visit and, uh, have fond, uh, memories of you being here. And, uh, makes me think, cause, uh, I would like, um, I'm looking for more content for First Amendment Radio. So if anyone out there maybe, uh, has a gift of gab or thinks they could develop it for God's kingdom, uh, you know, contact me. Or if you know anyone, you know, contact me that's looking for a venue to have their program produced. Uh, you get, you know, I can give you, all I can give you is free time. And, and you can do with the content. I, I don't, uh, uh, I, I could covet for you that you would be supported if you needed the support, uh, for doing the work because the workman is worthy of his hire. So I wouldn't begrudge anyone as I don't begrudge anyone. And, you know, we have a spot there that tells you to support not only First Amendment Radio, but, uh, the, uh, but those that, uh, contribute to the content here at First Amendment Radio. I even put a PayPal link and helped uh, Tom set that up. If you go to inquisitionupdate.org, uh, which is inquisitionupdate.wordpress.com, you'll see a link there. And, and Tom needs a little bit of support. He has, he is uh, supported otherwise by other means for his main support. But I think, uh, you know, a little supplemental support is always fine because I know he's not rich and doesn't have a lot of money. Uh, like I don't, you know, I'm not rich. I don't have a lot of money. There's not a whole lot of uh, money coming into First Amendment Radio. And if more came in, uh, let's say one of my, let's say a uh, 100,000 people bought my book here <laughs> when the Third Temple is built, um, suddenly I would have, you know, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars coming in. What would I do with that? Well, I would expand. I would open up the uh, school 
uh, the, the College of, of Protestantism. Of, uh, and we would teach not only Reformed theology, but Reformed eschatology. Because all of the Reformed churches out there are only teaching Reformed theology. And that's even a little messed up if they're teaching Reformed eschatology. But most of them don't even delve into eschatology of the Reformed churches anyway. They believe in amillennialism, but they don't really uh, preach or teach on that much. It's not really a, it's like a, a, a footnote in their curriculum. So they haven't really developed Reformed eschatology, which would be the historicism of, uh, that developed out of the rebel. And, you know, I'm writing a book about that and you can, you can see what I've written so far in the book, uh, in the article that I've done in defense. If you go to my website there at crosstheborder.org and you'll see I've got five, uh, five parts of that. Let's see. Oh, lecture five, um, in defense of the historical method of interpretation. So that's a book I'm working on. I got five chapters there already. Um, and, and they'll be, it'll be refined when I actually publish it into, uh, paperback or so that people can actually buy it online as a book in defense. And it'll have a lot more to go with it besides my lectures on the defense. And I'm working on lecture, uh, six right now or the sixth chapter of that book. So you should read that entire, uh, a series if you if you can you know if you have time uh and you can see where where we're going with that uh chapter six is looking pretty good too uh i just finished this one a millennial first resurrection pass so it's a defense of the historical method and of course we have to talk about uh the a millennial footnote of a reformed theological uh, institutions out there because that's all it is is a footnote. We have some great reform teachers out there. Uh, I play some of them like R.C. Sproul here on First Amendment Radio dot net. Uh, you can listen to him. Their broadcasts uh, we're a week behind every every uh, week here on First Amendment Radio, and I hope everyone's enjoying those broadcasts with the several hosts that they have on the programs called Renewing Your Mind. All very good reformed uh, theology. I was uh, looking at some comments and uh, some other uh, prophecy pages and stuff out there, and, and people are talking about uh, rapture theology and futurist theology. See, they're calling eschatology theology. They don't even know the difference. And no wonder they're lost. <laughs> they don't know the difference between theology and eschatology. And uh, if your theology is messed up, you're lost, you know, because your theology may say, well, I have to work my way into heaven, or I was born a Christian, or I'm a good man, and you're not really relying on the work that Christ, solely on the work that Christ did uh, on the cross and what he is doing in your life, and that you're actually living in his kingdom with him as your king day by day, uh, walking the repentance road, being perfected daily, and uh, going through that process of being perfected on the narrow way that leads to life. That's true Christianity. That's what it's all about. That's good theology. And the, the theology of the true gospel of Jesus Christ and his propitiatory substitute sacrifice uh, to take our place and pay the price for our sins. And without that firm and good theology, uh, you are likely lost, you know, because if your theology is, is Catholic theology, that is Roman Catholic theology, if it's Mormon theology, if it's LSD, LDS theology, if it's uh, name it, claim it theology, if it's uh, charismatic theology, if it's uh, the new apostolic reformation theology, you're likely lost. You're, you're just tares among the wheat. That's all you are. So theology is most important to get your theology correct. And then, um, yes, bad eschatology can really mess you up. Because, you know, if you believe in all this false uh, counter-reformation eschatology that was developed by the Jesuits just to beguile and, and abdicate the papacy and the Roman church from its rightful place in history and prophecy, and that is the Roman Catholic Church as the great apostasy and the seat of the Antichrist, the papacy, as the seat of the man of sin. And that's all that 
the end time antichrist uh, rapture eschatology was developed for just to vindicate the papacy and the antichrist. And now after those two things, everything else is uh, really kind of unimportant, you know. Um, and some things like, you know, like the flat earth thing, you know, people, flat earth is not in the Bible. I'm sorry, the words flat and earth are not in the Bible anywhere. Very unimportant, not even, not even important unless you're, uh, you have a wrong way of interpreting God's word because you have, do have to interpret God's word, uh, incorrectly. And they, it's the same type of interpretation method that the, uh, future dispensational futurists use and the atheists use to overthrow the scripture that you need to use to get flat earth out of the Bible. As I did a whole series on that, uh, and have a, uh, posting on my website and there are other links in there and there's a big debate on that in my website so you can learn just by going to my website which many people do one of the most popular uh, postings on my website is and you can see that if you go to my website right now there's a trending now in the uh, in the left hand column and if I put that on there you'll see um, right flat earth okay Oh, there it is. Flat Earth is spherical. Earth was the Bible say. It's always trending in the top ten over there. So, and and there's a link. Now I don't have a link on the top to it because I don't think it's as important as the other things that I'm high that I have uh, highlighted at the top of my website. Um, but like I said, it's always trending there. So if you want to know about the primer on the whole flat Earth debate, you can get it there and get it in the comments. And there are other links there, and you can get lost in that thing. But it's just, it's not important. It's not that important except for the method of interpretation that is required to divide a flat earth from the Bible is totally wrong. It's a terrible way to interpret the Bible. Okay? It's, like I said, it's what the atheists and the dispensational futurists use, the same method of interpretation. One, to, uh, yeah, divine the, uh, to vindicate the Antichrist and the other one to actually overthrow the Bible and discredit it, okay? And we don't want to use that method of interpretation. Very bad. Uh, and that's what I say about the, uh, about the Reformed theologists out there, the great ones. They need to apply to eschatology the same method of interpretation and the, and exegesis that they apply to theology. And that's in where they would end up is with, uh, the reformed, true reformed eschatology, which is, uh, pre-millennial historicism. There really is not another historicism out there. That's <laughs> the only one. So true historicism is pre-millennial. It can't be anything else. And I probably studied more on the topic, prob probably than anyone else on earth, at least. And if you know someone else who's studied more than me on historicism, well then, I want to know who they are so they can be my co-host and maybe I can learn from them too. Okay? Yeah. All right. Okay, well we're gonna, we're coming to the end of this hour. And, uh, like, uh, uh, we're going to, uh, jump back into the final, uh, uh, segment or installment of the history of apocalyptic interpretation. I believe it will be the final or at least the second from the final. And after that, I'm going to jump into a smaller text that will only probably last uh, two or three weeks, maybe a month at the most, if we do four segments in a month or four hours. And uh, you can find that, uh, let me see, if you go, okay, let's go go back to my website if you're there and I, I, can, I can get you over to the book itself that I'll be covering. And that is... Um, if you go to the Get the Book page, there's a link on that page. That's why we're going there. And if you scroll down, you'll see at the toward the bottom here, it says, uh, Save with Pocket Book Editions there, because we have Pocket Book Editions on the books on this page here. Um, but it takes you to my, to our Lulu Press, what do you call it, Author Spotlight. That's what it is. All of the books that we're publishing with Lulu Press. And you can see at the top, it has uh, the last prophecy, Hori Apocalyptic A. That is, uh, and these are EPUB editions here. We just published those. But right here, 
You'll see we have both in paperback and EPUB and free for any of my listeners uh, who want to go to the Get the Book, uh, our free ebook page. Then you have to ask for the destruction of Jerusalem at the time of Jacob's trouble. So we'll be going through that either beginning next week or the week after that, depending on, like I said, whether we actually finish um, the uh, history of apocalyptic interpretation today or next week. So then we'll start on the destruction of Jerusalem, the time of Jacob's trouble, uh, written about 1806, I believe. But uh, excellent, an excellent read and gives you uh, the true interpretation of uh, Jesus uh, and other prophecies and puts them in the, the right context. And everyone, I mean, how can you not agree with this book when it is spelled out all so clearly? And that is uh, the, uh, if I go to that page, I believe I already went there, here it is here, uh, The Destruction of Jerusalem, the Time of Jacob's Trouble. And uh, we have this published at for seven ninety nine for an EPUB, and uh, you can buy a paperback for fifteen bucks on that. Uh, or I said, like I said, you can get it for free. We give everything away. Uh, it's nice to have residual income from people that would never watch my broadcast, but find uh, will find stuff on Amazon or Barnes and Noble and find these these books there, or show up in a search and, and purchase them. And, or some people just like to have a uh, paperback. And I did this both in, no, I didn't do this in hardcover yet. Probably not going to do it in hardcover. Uh, we did publish the entire five books by E.B. Elliott, or six books by E.B. Elliott that we have. His entire library is available in hardcover. That is the four volumes of the Hori Apocalyptica, the History of Apocalyptic Interpretation, and of course this other one here, um, the last, the last prophecy, which is an abridgment of the Hori Apocalypse. Okay, those six volumes are all in hardcover or paperback, uh, for anyone who must have them in their library. I know there are some people that must have those things in their library, and I don't blame them at all. I like them in my library, because I use them. Yeah, and they're great reference works. And if you really want to understand historicism, uh, that is that is the set to have. But you can see other things that we have that go along the same lines. We have uh, the History uh, history Unveiling Prophecy by H. Grattan Guineas. Uh, definitely must have in your library and, uh, and other books, like my books, that you could have uh, When the Third Temple is Built, Key to the Apocalypse, and other works. So anyway, make sure you check out our complete library over there. And like I said, if you can't afford it, or you don't mind reading PDF or EPUBs, uh, you can get any of these things uh, for free just by going to the free ebook tab at crosstheborder.org or nicholasarthur.wordpress.com and following the instructions there and then asking for the title by name. If you don't ask for the title by name, uh, you will get a copy of The Rapture Will Be Cancelled. <laughs> so... That's the way that works, okay? All right, let me see if uh, anyone's saying anything over here. Uh, Tom says, yes, when Tom came out and visited me, he says, that was a good vacation. Yeah, we surely enjoyed having you here. I hope everything's uh, working out good for you there where you're at, Tom, and you're able to, uh, to work in God's kingdom. I want everyone to work in God's kingdom wherever they are. That's, that should be the object. Okay, like I said, we're going to be coming back, uh, jumping into and uh, maybe concluding the history of apocalyptic interpretation. Not very popular. <laughs> but hey, you know, God didn't call me to do all this stuff that was popular. He's called me to do stuff that's not popular. And that's just the way that works. Obedience is mine. The results are his. That has to be our attitude. Well, may the Almighty bless you and keep you as you continue on a narrow way that leads to life. We'll see you next time. The book of Revelation says, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app. 
for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the Third Temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the Third Temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a Third Temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's crossTheBorder.org.